palestrantes, a gente vai liberar a fala é, como palestrante no momento em que for é, realizar a palestra. Tá? Para, os demais, para as demais pessoas que estão na chamada, é, a palestra ela, ela não, vai ser aberta, não vai ser aberta a possibilidade de fala e nem de vídeo. Né? Para os demais participantes, vocês só vão assistir e aí a maneira de interação é através ou do bate-papo aqui embaixo ou desse botão chamado QIA, se vocês quiserem fazer questões para os palestrantes, tá legal? Mm -hmm. Ok, so uh, I'm just going to explain everything again in, in English. So uh, for the lectures that are not here with us now, uh, talking and having this video conversation, we are going to open the video conversation uh, when uh, the time of a talk Uh, comes mm -hmm. and uh, also for the other participants that are uh, hosted here as a participant and uh, you are just going to watch the presentation and uh, you are not going to be able to talk uh, unless we allow you and uh, you are not going to be uh, and you are going to be able to share uh, your words with us through the chat here uh, in this bar here below in, the, in your, your desktop uh, and also through the, through the button Q&A. Uh, so we, we ask you to make your questions through the button Q&A for the participants, for the, for the lecturers, sorry, and uh, for the professors here, which are going to give you the talks. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, really a pleasure to be here and uh, it's really a pleasure to open this event. Uh, we are going to have now a quick open section, and I would like to thank, uh, uh, anticipating all the professors and uh, all the researchers which uh, we invited and we have the pleasure to, uh, to receive here in, in the International Symposium of Physics. Uh, so we have uh, uh, some authorities here from UFCG, and then uh, we are going to start with uh, giving the word for these uh, authorities. So uh, I have here the pleasure to receive the Rector of UFCG, Professor Vicemar Simões, the Vice Rector of UFCG, Professor, Professor Camilo uh, Simões, uh, the Vice Director of the Center for Science and, Teclo and Technology of UFCG, Professor Arimatea, uh, and uh, as the Prorector of uh, post-graduation uh, of UFCG, Professor Sinara Branco. So uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to receive you all. And then uh, I'm going to pass the word for Professor Vicemario Simões. Uh, you can give us your, your speech, Professor, in Portuguese or in English, as you prefer. So feel free to, to give your words. Thank you. Professor, professor Vicemário, você pode começar. Muito bom, bom dia. É good morning. Bem, deixa o, o inglês mais fluente para assinar e Camilo. É, então, muito prazer em na, fazer parte da abertura desse evento internacional, um simpósio em física. É, para o FCG é muito gratificante. Mostra o compromisso e a qualificação dos que fazem aquela unidade acadêmica por meio do seu programa de pré-graduação e pesquisa, é tanto uma contribuição valiosa para o mundo, né, já incluindo também nossa região aqui, tão carente, mas de pessoas tão imbuídas em boas propostas. Aí, aí, como exemplo, nosso telescópio, que está em andamento, inclusive a Milka, que faz parte desse projeto, com outras pessoas de outras instituições do país e fora do país, estamos, então, dando toda a contribuição, quando digo estamos ao UFCG, para que a gente possa instalar esse grande empreendimento em prol da pesquisa do mundo. Então, João Rafael, muito obrigado pelo convite, um fraterno abraço ao professor Camilo, nosso vice-reitor, a Sinara, que é quem representa a pró-reitoria de pós-graduação, em nome do professor Benemar, a você, João Rafael, é, por esse tempo, né, na verdade, em realizar esse evento, não é fácil, você sabe, né, há quanto, quanto tempo você não vem é, trabalhando, ao professor Igor, a Milka, como já disse, a Rodrigo Lima, a todos os convidados aqui presentes, e muitos são muitos, e a palestrante, logo depois dessa semana de abertura, a professora Michele, é que seja bem-vinda, 
e que possa dar, na verdade, a sua contribuição à ciência do mundo. Então, mais uma vez, de forma muito rápida, né, João Rafael, as aberturas têm que ser muito sucintas, muito curtinhas, né, que, na verdade, é, a, 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 o que as pessoas estão esperando é a palestra da professora, né, que tratará é, do tema acerca da técnicas computacionais aplicadas à astronomia e cosmologia. Bem, eu só para concluir, eu sou, sou engenheiro químico né, e químico, então, de física eu sei muito pouco, somente, João Rafael, a parte de físico química não tem nada como não interagir. Mas fui aluno dessa instituição né, e todas a, as físicas básicas com seus laboratórios e mecânicos eu fiz pela essa conceituada unidade acadêmica que a época chamava Departamento de Física. A todos vocês, um evento exitoso, que possa aproveitar e a nossa UCG, no nome de João Rafael e Igor, que a gente possa prosperar e, no final desse evento, consiga escrever a carta de Campina Grande para que outros eventos que virão por aí, patrocinados né, por outras instituições, possam dar continuidade. Um fraterno abraço e muito bom dia. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vicemari, for your kind words and for your beautiful speech. So now I pass the, the, the word for Professor Camilo, the Vice Rector of UFCG. Professor, feel free to give us your words. Bom dia a todos. Eu vou fazer uma fala em inglês também, para tentar falar em inglês, para que possa atingir aí o maior público. Então, é good morning to everyone. Thank you for, uh, very much for having me here, uh, Professor João and uh, the other colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in this event opening, and we wish uh, that you could be uh, that you could share knowledge in the subject of interest of this event. Uh, I, I I just took a look, and you're going to talk about upper atmosphere, condensed matter, particles, com cosmology, and gravity. And all these subjects are, over, are very important uh, to the community. And we wish you an, uh, a wonderful event. And yes, my greetings to, to Professor Vicemario Simões, Professor Sinaria Branco, Professor Igor, uh, Professor João and the other colleagues. And yes, I, I hope the International Symposium on Physics uh, go on with many uh, 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 the, uh, many uh, opportunities every, I, I believe it's every two years, right, João? Uh, you have the event and I hope, it, I hope this can go on. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity and have a nice event. Okay, thank you, Camilo. Thank you so much for your presence and uh, for all your Uh, bonus uh, together with me uh, during this uh, the preparation of this event. So now I would like to uh, to share the words with Professor Sinara Branco, who is representing here uh, the uh, prorector of research of research and post graduation of the UFCG. So Professor Sinara, feel free to share with us your words. Bom dia a todos e a todas presentes. Eu vou pedir licença também para, como Camilo, usar a palavra em inglês para tentar atingir né, o maior número de participantes possível. Well, uh, dear colleagues, researchers and students here present, by greeting the dear Vice Mario Simões and Camilo, Also, uh, Professor João Rafael Lúcio, I greet you all on behalf of the Dean of Graduate Studies, Professor Benemar Alencar de Souza. I would like to thank João Rafael, especially, for inviting me and Professor Benemar Alencar de Souza to participate on this moment with you. It's an honor for Universidade Federal de Campina Grande to host the International Symposium of Physics, and I acknowledge the effort and the dedication of Unidade Acadêmica de Física and uh, Pós-Graduação em Física that have faced a pandemic situation 
and other challenges. And once again, have, have organized the event, overcoming obstacles and the difficulties that are common at these situations. The institutions here gathered include researchers from Brazil, and I will cite some of them, okay, USP, Unicamp, UEPB, UFPE, UFC, UFSCA, UFPB, UFRN, and the Observatório Nacional. And from abroad, and this is a very nice opportunity to share this situation with you, so the, the pandemic situation also favored us in including so many uh, researchers from all over the world. And so this is the good point of the pandemic, in fact. Okay, so uh, we'll, I will cite some of them, Argentina, Nigeria, USA, Canada, England, South Africa, Japan, India, Norway, Germany, so many countries, and this is really very, very important for us. So we are all sharing knowledge and, just, and this shows that our creativity, eager to work and our need to keep together to do research have won the limitation of sponsoring events as well as the coronavirus. So for all, all these points, I wish you a very profitable event with good contacts and the spread of knowledge and information. So thank you very much, João, thank you. Thank you, Senara, thank you for these beautiful words. It is really a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much for all your help also during this process, during the organization of this event. And now uh, I would like to to share the word with Professor José Arimatea, from, uh, which is the Vice Director of the Center for Science and Technology, and Technology here at UFCG. So, uh, Professor Arimatea, feel free to share your words with us. Bom dia a todos. Good morning for all. Uh, primeiramente, gostaria de parabenizar a Comissão Organizadora, Professor João Rafael, Professor Igor, pela realização desse evento, o apoio né, que a instituição dá, a Unidade Acadêmica de Física, a PRPG, a Reitoria, em nome do centro, a gente está sempre acompanhando a evolução desse departamento, tem crescido bastante, e a realização desse evento é mais uma mostra né, do, 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 da competência né, desses jovens professores do Departamento de Física têm e de suas atividades de pesquisa, de, de ensino, têm feito... É, à frente dessa grande unidade de física. Proferi algumas palavras curtinhas da inglês para dar as boas-vindas aos nossos colegas estrangeiros. Né? É... Good morning for all. The director of science and technology recognizes all the effort, efforts made by the organizing committee by organization of this event. And we, for all the professor, professors and researchers who participate in this event, we, you all are welcome and we wish you enjoy this event because it was made by uh, the professors uh, from our university with uh, very effort and a good job. So, Thank you for all. Thank you for the uh, organizing committee, and special Professor João Rafael. Good, good morning for all. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. It's, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you in one more event with us. So uh, I really appreciate your words and thank you so much. Now I, I would like to pass the, the words for our. Uh, my colleagues here in the organizing committee. So I'm going to start with Professor Rodrigo Lima, who is a member of our postgraduate program. So Professor Rodrigo, feel free to share your words with us. Thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to share my presentation. Good morning, everyone. I welcome to the first edition 
by ISP 2020, I would like to show you some numbers about the ISP 2020. The coronavirus allowed this event, it's uh, good. And we have uh, participants from the all continents, Professor Senara say, for about numbers, we have uh, 20 countries, 44 video posters, 96 abstracts, 42 lectures and talks, and 360 subscribes. It's a lot of people together with us. And then, and I hope everyone has a great weekend of learning and enjoy the this meeting. I think it's so little words because the time and I pass the word for Trump. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rodrigo, for sharing this data with us and uh, showing that uh, I see, I, I, ISP is really a milestone in this uh, history of the physics department here at UFCG. So now I'd like to, to share the word with Professor Igo, my other organizing fellow here in the event, and uh, he's also the chief of our, the director of our uh, department. So Professor Igo, feel free to share the words. Good morning, everybody. My greetings to the Professor Vicemario Simões and the other authorities present here. Uh, we thank for the efforts of everybody to, to make this event real. real. And I would like to, to invite everybody here to have a great experience on uh, physics. Uh, we did our best to, to prepare an interesting uh, uh, program, uh, including the, the fields of upper atmosphere, uh, condensed matters, particle, uh, gravity, and cosmology. And uh, we hope uh, we have good times during the next four days here. Thank you for your for your presence here and uh, uh, we hope we have a, a, a good meeting, uh, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Okay, thank you, Igor. So just to end this, this opening section, uh, I'd like to say that it's an honor and a privilege for me to be part of this organizing committee for the International Symposium on Physics. This, we, this year was really tough and we had this new challenge of living and surviving among the actual pandemic and showing the importance of and the value of science for our society. And in such a spirit, the ISP represents to me a path to show to our academic community and society how beautiful science can be and how valuable it is for us. Since I do not have much time here, I just would like to thank all the participants, our the panelists, our lecturers and students who are helping us right now uh, at the backstage of this presentation. I also would like to thank the ATO administration of UFCG who made it, who made it possible to acquire uh, this platform that we are using here and uh, gave us all the support to make this event come true. I also would like to thank my co-organizers fellows, Professor Igor and Professor Rodrigo who worked with me during days and nights to make this event possible. It was such a challenge to make this event, but as I told you, it also represents a milestone for our university and for the community on astronomy and physics of Brazil. So please feel welcome to ISP 2020 and enjoy it as best as you can. So thank you all. It's really a pleasure to receive all of you here and now uh, I would like to uh, share the word with Professor Amilcar Queiroz to introduce our first speaker, Professor Michelle Lochner. Thank you so much, Professor Michelle, 
and uh, feel free, Amilcar, to uh, introduce our first speaker. Okay, just a second. Uh, okay, uh, welcome all. It's nice to to have all of you. Let's start our session, the first session, the first uh, talk by Michelle Lochner. She she is in the university she had his her PhD at the University of Cape Town, postdoc at University College at London, United Kingdom. And uh, she is now a professor at the University of Western Cape, South Africa. And she is a member of Sky Sky Telescope. So it's Nice to have you here. Please, if I made any mistake, please correct me during your talk. And uh, so you can start at any time. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Zhao, and thanks to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Of course, I'd rather be there in person with all of you, but um, unfortunately, these are, these are the circumstances we find ourselves in. And well done for organizing the conference under such uh, difficult circumstances. So I'm going to share my screen. Ah, I'm afraid you're going to have to enable screen sharing. Um, so just while that's uh, being set up, I should just give a little bit on my background. I realize this is a very general and impressively general conference. Um, so my background is in astronomy. Well, cosmology, astronomy. Um, and I um, really do a lot of work on machine learning, statistics, uh, basically dealing with uh, big data in astronomy. So I'm going to keep this fairly general and pedagogical, and um, I hope you will just ask lots of questions as we go through. All right, so you should be able to see that. I should mention uh, a few of my collaborators. A lot of this work is done with a variety of really great people who are all listed here. Okay, so let me set the stage uh, by talking about some of the amazing upcoming telescopes uh, in astronomy that are, are going, that are about to drown us in data, basically. So the first one I want to mention is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is a telescope under construction in Chile. Um, some of you may have heard of it as by its old name, which is LSST, which now reserves, refers to the survey. This is an amazing telescope. It's a, it's a 10 meter class telescope and it's, it's got incredible optics that allows it to view a very large patch of sky, but also observe quite deep and do this very quickly, which means um, it can basically build a movie of the universe uh, to an incredible precision and area that uh, has never been done before. And it's, it's going to do a wide range of science, including cosmology, but also things like asteroids um, and studies of the Milky Way. But I think one of the most interesting science cases is the study of transients. So a transient is anything in the universe that changes in brightness. So this is a video of uh, what it might look like. And every single dot that you see on this video is a supernova. So that's the death of a massive star. And supernovae are incredibly important for cosmology, which I'll mention a little bit later. But what's impressive about the Rubin Observatory is the sheer number of supernovae that will be detected in the survey. And in fact, this telescope is um, so fast and has such a large area that it's incredibly sensitive to a large number of transient events. In fact, every single night, we are going to get 10 million alerts from the Rubin Observatory. So 10 million times a night, something in the sky will change. And only about half of those are things like satellites and cosmic rays and whatever. So that's, you know, 5 million different astrophysical things going on every single night. So this is an enormous data set and all our past analysis techniques just aren't gonna cut it to handle this volume of data. 
So that's, that's really where the machine learning comes in that I'm going to talk about in a minute. The other telescope that I'm involved in, um, which is on the radio side of the spectrum, is the Square Kilometer Array. When this is built, it will be the biggest telescope in the world. Um, and it's, you know, we're talking about thousands of these antennas working together to build a giant telescope. And part of it's under construction in South Africa, part of it's under construction in Australia. And the raw data rates are absurd. It's, it's of the order of many petabytes a day. And uh, even the process data is incredibly large. We're, we're talking about uh, a catalog of well over a billion galaxies in the radio, um, as well as also quite a lot of radio transients. Now the square kilometer array is only sort of just beginning, but what we have at the moment is what's called a, a, a precursor telescope called Meerkat, which has been built in South Africa. And um, this is a 64 dish radio telescope and is, is already a world-class instrument. Uh, it's, it's got very high resolution of extremely high sensitivity for a radio telescope. And already the data rates coming out of Meerkat, although they're only a fraction of the size of what we're expecting from SKA, um, we're still talking about terabytes for a single data set. So we are also having to change, you know, traditionally radio astronomers would download data onto their laptop and then sit and reduce it for ages and play around with it. And we just can't do that anymore. Um, the data rates are already starting to challenge our current analysis methods. So we're facing this data explosion and that kind of sets the scene for why machine learning is um, picking up so quickly in astronomy and similarly in many other fields is really, it's really being driven by the fact that we have so much more data than we did at any point in the past. And it's really changing how we do things. So I don't wanna assume any background on machine learning. So I'm gonna give a, a short uh, introduction to some of the concepts uh, that are involved. Okay, so the first thing I want to mention is something called supervised machine learning. Now, 99% of the time when you read about a machine learning uh, problem or look at a paper or read an article, they're talking about supervised machine learning. So here's like a classical example. This is a classification problem. So say you've got two different types of objects, some are crosses, some are circles. And what you want to do is you want to learn how to divide the crosses and the circles so that anytime a new data point arrives, you know which one it is without having to, um, you know, without doing anything else, without needing to look at it. And so in this case, you would need some known data, some training data to be able to learn this line. Now, there's nothing weird or foreign about this concept. We are physicists. We are good at building models. That's really what we do. Um, so you could very, if you look at this image, you could very easily come up with a model that would draw a line that would perfectly divide the crosses and circles. The key difference is that with machine learning, it learns the model automatically without you having to tell it whether it's a, you know, a, a straight line or a parabola or whatever kind of model. So it takes that part out of uh, the problem that you know, the need to come up with the model. So machine learning takes a data set of known with known labels and automatically learns what this model should be so that you can use it for future data to make predictions. To simplify this or to illustrate it further, um, this is a, a, pro a problem I like to give my students actually when I'm teaching machine learning. So this is the simplest neural network that I could think of. Now, neural networks are arguably the oldest type of machine learning algorithm, and um, they've, they've recently evolved over the past decade or so, had an incredible resurgence in popularity because of something called deep learning. So neural networks are loosely based on how we think the human brain works, or how we th thought at the time anyway. The idea is that you have inputs, so this is some input data, and you're trying to figure out how to map that input to that output, as, as you always are with machine learning. And what you include is this hidden layer of neurons that you can see are connected to the various inputs and then connected together to the output. And what I just want to illustrate is that you can actually write down an equation 
which would give you the output given a set of inputs uh, and given known weights. These are all the weight functions. And the only reason I show this is to kind of demystify me machine learning a little bit further to show you that it's really just a model. And uh, when we train the algorithm, we're training the various parameters uh, of this extremely complicated nonlinear model. I mean, if you were to try to write down this equation for some of the neural networks that are used um, for real machine learning problems, it would be pages and pages long because they're very complicated, and, uh, et cetera. But it's still, at its heart, an equation that maps inputs to outputs. OK. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the jargon that you might hear when people talk about machine learning. And uh, this is also kind of defines the, the, the way that most machine learning problems go. The first thing is you always start with your data. So this, this is a completely data-driven field. You don't first come up with a hypothesis and, and then look at the, the data. You always start off with your data. Um, although in some cases, this could actually be a set of simulations. Uh, machine learning is often done on some simulations, but it, it, it's still a form of data. The next step that happens in most machine learning problems, or at least traditional machine learning, is feature extraction. This is a really critical step because data are usually very complicated and high dimensional. And it's difficult for any machine learning algorithm to interpret this data to try to solve whatever problem you're trying to solve. So the feature extraction step is really important. Here's an example. This is a fingerprint, an image of a fingerprint. If you think about it, an image is actually a very complicated type of data. It could be made up of thousands of pixels and every pixel can have a different value. So this is a very complicated high dimensional piece of data. But we know something about fingerprints. We've known about fingerprints for 200 years. We know that there are special points on a fingerprint called minutia points that when you combine them uniquely define a fingerprint. So you don't need the whole image of the fingerprint. You just need these special points. So you can measure these points, translate them into numbers, and you reduce thousands of pixels, a very complicated type of data, into just a few numbers. And it's those numbers that can then go into a machine learning algorithm. So the step of feature extraction is really, really critical. And it usually relies on having some uh, some knowledge of the problem. So this is, this is often where the real science comes in because you have to have some understanding of the, the type of data that you're working with and the kind of problem you're trying to solve. After feature extraction, there's two types of machine learning and it depends on uh, what kind of data you have. Most of the time, most machine learning problems are supervised, which means they have some labeled data. So there's some subset of the data for which you know the answer that you're trying to predict. So in that first example I showed you, you would have some amount of data where you know if it's a, a cross or a plus, you know which class it belongs to. And the other branch of machine learning, which is much uh, less talked about, is unsupervised machine learning, where you don't have any labels. You basically don't know anything about your data. Um, and this is actually what I'm going to spend most of the, the talk on. But let me first cover uh, some of the concepts in supervised learning. There's two other branches uh, in supervised learning. One is if you have categorical data, then you're doing a classification problem. So the canonical hello world type problem in machine learning is telling the difference between cats and dogs. So you have a bunch of images and you're trying to, to teach a model, to train a machine learning model to tell the difference between cats and dogs. And so you'll have some sub subset for which you know the answer, the algorithm learns to classify them and uh, there you go, you can predict whether it's a cat or a dog. The other type is where you have continuous data where you're trying, and this is called regression. So you're trying to predict a quantity. Um, for the cosmologists in the audience, a typical example of this is trying to predict photometric redshifts, which is a, a critical quantity in uh, cosmology. Under unsupervised learning, 
um, it's, it's a much harder problem. When you don't have labels, it's, it's harder to know what you can really do with your data. And there's more or less um, two different kind of branches of things that you can do with data when you don't have any labels. One is called clustering, which is where you try to learn some underlying structure that's in your data without knowing a priori what the labels are. Um, so here's an example of uh, Wikipedia pages, actually. So each dot represents an entire Wikipedia page. And you can sort of see, although it's quite messy, there is some structure here, like there's a, a cluster on its own, and here's a few clusters on their own. And then you can go look at those pages and see what they are, and you can see, oh, all of these are things called disambiguation pages. These are all sports, etc. cetera. So, so clustering can be a useful tool. And then there's anomaly detection, which is mostly what I'm gonna talk about a bit later which is basically where it tries to find outliers in the data. So things that are very different from the norm. Okay, but I won't go into that now because I'm going to talk a lot about it in a minute. I'll just, um, okay. So I just wanted to give an example of uh, a supervised machine learning problem that I've worked on, which is uh, supernova classification. So a supernova is an exploding star. So um, when stars reach the end of life, they explode in a beautiful and dramatic fashion. And as a cosmologist, there's really only two types of supernovae. There's the ones that we like and are useful, and then there's the ones we don't like. Um, so these are a very special type of supernovae called type 1As, which I'm not gonna go into now, but basically, we, we can use them to learn about the expansion history of the universe. So we, we, we learn an incredible amount of cosmological information from this particular type of supernova. But the problem is all the other types, the core collapse supernovae are contaminants. They don't behave in the right way. We can't rely on them. They're not useful tools. So in cosmology, it's really critical when you observe a supernova to know, is it a type 1A or not? But there's a problem. You remember that video that I showed you in the beginning where every single dot was a supernova? I mean, there's, there's thousands of them. There's, at, by the end of the survey, we'll probably have a couple million of them. And the problem is the only way to know whether this little dot that's, that's getting brighter and fader, fader in the sky, the only way to know if you've got the good one, the type 1A or not, is if you take a spectrum of it. And a spectrum is a difficult thing to take. It takes a lot of telescope time and it's very expensive. Um, and so, and the Rubin Observatory isn't capable of taking spectra. It's what's called a photometric telescope. So this is a huge problem. We're gonna have this enormous data set of supernovae, but we won't know whether they're type 1As or core collapse. So what we did, I mean, this is, relatively old work by now, but it's still a, a very actively worked on problem, is we took the light curve of the supernova, so the brightness as a function of time in different filters. The telescope has physically different filters on it. Um, so this was our input data. And we trained a machine learning algorithm to be able to tell the difference between the type 1As and all the other types of supernovae um, as, a, as a typical classification machine learning problem. Um, so this is just a, a kind of representation of how the algorithm is able to split up the different um, supernova types, which are in different colors. And it works very well, but um, the, this problem is extremely challenging and is incredibly important for the Rubin Observatory. So it's, it's one of the most active fields of research uh, in cosmology at the moment. So I've left some references here and I'll, I'll make my slides available. Um, if you're not familiar with the archive, uh, you can just Google archive, and, or even if you just copy this number, this whole number and put it into Google, then the, the paper will come up. So um, yeah, that's how you can get these references. Okay, I just wanted to show you this as an example. I didn't wanna really spend a lot of time on this. What I wanna spend a lot of time on is this topic that's been fascinating me for about the last year and a half which is anomaly detection. And I think this is, a, this is a really cool topic, not only in astronomy, but in, in basically every field of science where there's lots of data. That's an interesting problem. Okay, so 
what is an anomaly? An anomaly is, is really anything that's rare or, or very different from the normal. So in astronomy, we have uh, quite a few examples of these. This is this beautiful image is a strong gravitational lens, um, which are very rare objects, very scientifically interesting. Uh, this many of you will have recognized as the, the gravitational wave, the first gravitational wave event. Um, these are extremely rare events. This is an example of something called a fast radio burst. Uh, this is the bullet cluster. So these are all uh, rare astronomical uh, events or objects, and they would all be classed as anomalies. But the thing is, these are all things that we know about and are looking for. So we're always looking for gravitational waves, we're looking for strong lenses, etc. What I think is really interesting is the unknown unknowns. So the the anomalous and weird objects that we're not expecting, that we're not looking for. And here's my favorite example of this. This is the, the 1967 discovery of a pulsar. So a pulsar is a, is a fascinating astrophysical object. Um, and they're, they're known as cosmic clocks because they repeat so regularly, um, such that when they were discovered by Jocelyn Bell Burnell, there was a question as to whether this might be a signal from aliens or not. It turns out not to be. But um, the point that I really want to highlight here, I mean, this is one of the greatest discoveries in astronomy history. And the only way that this object was discovered was a very bright graduate student. Her supervisor never picked it up, but the graduate student picked it up. She looked at all this data and she noticed something very weird. She noticed this weird signal and that led to a Nobel Prize. Now, the, the question that I have is how are we going to make these kinds of groundbreaking discoveries when there's 10 million alerts every night, when you're looking at a data set of a billion galaxies, when there is so much data that there's not enough graduate students in the world to look at all of it and make these amazing discoveries. And so this is the question that, that I've been puzzling on um, for the last little while. So there are uh, anomaly detection machine learning algorithms that I've been trying to employ to solve this problem. And more or less the way these algorithms work, so you can give it a data set that doesn't have any labels, obviously because you don't know beforehand what's an anomaly and what's not. That's the whole point, they're new discoveries. So you can give an algorithm an entire data set. It has different ways of trying to learn what the normal objects look like, and then it labels uh, outliers that are far away from the norm as anomalies more or less how they work. So what am I talking about? Take a look at this slide. Look at all of these example signals. So these are, these are completely made up um, signals that I've generated. One out of these nine is an anomaly. So just look for a second and see which one do you think it is. Just think to yourself. OK. So the one that's actually an anomaly is this one. So all of these are generated from a sine wave with different parameters. And this one is a sum of five sine waves, I think. So this is the anomaly in the data set. But it, it's, it's quite hard, right? I mean, this one looks quite different to all the others. You, you, you would think maybe this one could be an anomaly. So being able to tell the difference between what's a true anomaly and what's just belonging to the normal population, but behaving, you know, just being a statistical outlier is quite a difficult problem. So the way some of these, uh, I'm not going to go uh, in depth into this at all, um, but these are two example anomaly detection algorithms that I make use of. Uh, the one is called isolation forest, uh, which basically tries to learn a series of cuts in the data um, to try to get each object on its own. And you can see that this object over here only requires like two cuts and then it's on its own, whereas this one needs, you know, I don't know, eight cuts or so to get on its own. So this one is categorized as more anomalous than this one. And then there's one called local outlier factor, which simply looks for points that are in low density regions. So these are just two example anomaly detection algorithms. 
Um, I want to mention these, but not go into detail. Uh, these are anomaly detection algorithms that I've worked on uh, with the previous group that I was part of, um, which are novel anomaly detection algorithms. You can look them up there. Okay, but what I really want to talk about is this interesting idea that uh, my colleague and I had, which was that we realized that just doing anomaly detection isn't enough to solve the problem we're trying to solve. We were trying to solve the problem of finding scientifically interesting objects in large data sets very quickly. That's what we're trying to do. Now, um, I had a, a student come to me with she had she had uh, she was part of a program called Deeper, Wider, Faster, and she'd observed uh, a patch of sky and had a million light curves. So they had observed a, a bunch of objects and watched how their brightness changed with time. I and mean, she had a million of these things, and she didn't even know where to start in in trying to dig through this data to find something interesting. And so we ran anomaly detection uh, anomaly detection algorithm on it, and we came up with a bunch of anomalies. But the key thing is that these objects, which look quite strange, you see that dip there, these aren't actually interesting. These are instrumental effects. These objects are real sources. These are variable stars. So something can be an anomaly, but be boring. And what's interesting is the, um, the what's interesting to one person may not be interesting to another. So as a scientist, I may only care about weird supernovae and I don't care about variable stars or the other way around. So there was this idea that we need to uh, somehow personalize the anomaly detection for the scientist who's making use of this thing. And that's where something called active learning comes in. So active learning is kind of cool. The idea is that you take the raw processing power of machine learning, and you combine it with the intuition and the knowledge of a human expert in such a way that it minimizes the amount of time you waste of the, the human experts. So it's, it's, a, it's very clever. Um, and we came up with a new kind of a new way of doing active learning uh, for this problem. And so uh, my colleague Bruce and I wrote this program called Astronomaly. I'm very proud of the name, although it can be quite hard to say. Um, and if you're interested, the code is publicly available. And what Astronomaly is, is it's a Python backend. So it, it, it uses Python to do kind of all the heavy lifting. So it reads in astronomical data. It does that feature extraction step. Remember that I said was so important and it runs some anomaly detection algorithms. But the key thing is that it does this active learning loop to improve the anomaly detection. And the way it gets feedback from a human is I built this web interface that interacts with it. So, okay, so let's, let's go back to that, uh, that example that I showed you in the beginning of some, some synthetic data that I'd made up um, to kind of illustrate this, this idea a little bit more. So what are we looking at? This plot is a clever way of condensing very high dimensional complicated data into to simple, a simple two dimensional space. So every dot here is actually an entire curve like this. And so this cluster of dots all look something like this. They're all generated from sine waves. And this big cluster of dots looks something like this. They're all generated from parabolas. So that's, those two are my two boring classes. They're my normal class. Um, and 99% of the data that I generated was from this normal boring class. But you see that there's these clusters of, of things that are kind of uh, a bit different. And there's also some that belong to the normal class, which are a bit different as well. There's just outliers. These are the anomalous classes. So I, I, in my imaginary world where I'm simulating this data, I pretended that there were these three very anomalous types of curves. That's the step function and Gaussian, and that was that sum of sine waves you saw earlier. Now, to test the active learning part, I had to pre I pretended that this class, even though it's anomalous, so it's rare, it's actually not interesting to me. It's some kind of artifact. It's something boring I don't care about. 
this class, I thought was ah, it's kind of sort of interesting. Maybe I, I want to know about it. But this was like the Nobel Prize winning, super exciting uh, anomalous object that I want to know lots about. OK, then I ran this through astronomically. And um, this is just a, an animation showing you what the interface actually looks like. So here I'm looking at my data and I'm browsing through it. So you can, it's a very easy way of, of looking at lots of, of data very comfortably. And what I've done is I've sorted this data set. It's about 50,000 objects. I've sorted it just randomly. So not surprisingly, everything you're seeing is either a sine wave or a parabola. So those boring objects. Then I run an anomaly detection algorithm on it. And it does a really great job. So now I've, I've ranked the data from most anomalous to least anomalous. So it does really well. It, it doesn't even show any objects of the boring classes because they're way down the list. But you'll notice that the ones that are cropping up are that Gaussian and that step function. And remember I said, I don't like the Gaussian. I don't want to see it. It's boring. So what I do is you see there's these numbers here. So I can use those to label a very small set of data. You don't have to label a lot, and it only takes a few minutes, but label a very small set of data to tell the algorithm whether it's interesting or not. So I gave everything with the Gaussian a zero, everything at the step function a three, and then if I saw the sum of sine waves, I gave that a five. And then if you run the active learning algorithm and re-rank, reorder the objects, now it does a much better job. You don't even see those Gaussians. We see lots of the sum of sine waves, which was the one I was really interested in. So if you've ever used Netflix or Amazon or um, Google, they all have things called recommendation engines in them, where it's like, because you like this show, I think you'll also like this other show. Or because you bought this, maybe you'll buy this. And so it kind of recommends things to you. You can think of astronomy as a recommendation engine for interesting astronomical anomalies. Um, so I think, yeah, I've got time. So this is um, the, the active learning approach that we came up with. Uh, I'm not usually a fan of showing equations in talks, but I think in this case, it's a relatively simple one. So this is just to show the idea that we, what we do, what do we do? Okay. First of all, we start with the machine learning anomaly score. So this is the score that comes out of the machine learning algorithm. Okay. So we have two different terms in this, basically. We've got one, which is the, the label that the user has given. So remember, a user has come along and labeled the data as interesting or not interesting on a scale of zero to five. But we also have this distance penalty term. And this is really important because you're only labeling a small, like a very small subset of the data, much less than you would for like a classification problem, for instance. So that, but that means um, if you're trying to predict whether a user is going to like an anomaly that's quite far away from anything that's been labeled, it's not going to work very well. So what this term does is if there's no labeled data in the vicinity, this all just tends to one and you just default back to the anomaly score. If there is some labeled data nearby, then it's the anomaly score gets weighted by the user score. So basically what was happening in the previous example is it was just down weighting those Gaussians that I didn't care about. So I was less likely to see them. And here's a visualization of it. So you can think of this as a representation of data space. So each point is a new object. And uh, it's colored by the anomaly score. So this is the raw anomaly score that comes out of the machine learning algorithm. And the black, so a light color means it thinks it's very anomalous. Dark color means it thinks it's not very anomalous at all. And then the numbers are what I have labeled as a user. So I've basically told the algorithm look, everything around here in this kind of space is boring to me. I don't want to know about it. But these ones, yeah, these are really interesting. Show me more. And so when you run that uh, equation that I showed you previously, what it will do is it will downweight these uh, 
uh, objects that I said were boring. So anything new that comes in that's similar to one of these, it's not going to show it, but it upweights these ones and these stay pretty much the same. Okay, so that's the idea of, of how it works. And uh, just to show you this in action with some real uh, data. This is an example using a data set called Galaxy Zoo, which is also publicly available. You can Google it. And again, what I've done is I'm showing you a subset of the data where I've sorted it randomly. And you can see that most of these objects, as pretty as they are, uh, are elliptical or spiral galaxies, and they're quite boring. If I run an anomaly detection algorithm, you can now see that most of the objects that it finds are um, things that are doing something interesting. It's usually interacting galaxies, merging galaxies, things with tidal streams, but you do see the occasional artifact. So like for instance, that was a satellite or sometimes it's a star nearby. So the artifacts are kind of messing around with um, the stuff I'm actually interested in. And if I run uh, an active, if I run active learning, then what happens, so after you see that, uh, sorry, in the previous slide, you can see that the numbers were changing. So I was, I was giving these scores as I go along. And if you run the active learning, then um, it does a much better job. And now all the things that it's showing me pretty much, it is still the odd artifact, but pretty much everything is uh, a merger or, or just something morphologically interesting. And to kind of summarize it uh, more easily, so here's a snapshot, some examples of the, the boring class of galaxies, or ordinary boring galaxies. Here's what it looks like when you run, uh, so these are the top 12 when you run machine learning, so top 12 the most anomalous objects. So you can see here where these artifacts get in, okay, these are actually interesting. And, um, then I ran, after running the active learning, this is the top 12 set of galaxies that I hadn't seen yet. So you can think of it as these are the top 12 recommended galaxies from Astronomy, what it thinks I will find interesting based on the labels that I've already given it. So it seems to do a pretty good job. Um, this just shows quantitatively how the act of learning uh, does improve the number of anomalies detected, particularly early on in the list. And this is what we want. We are never going to be able to guarantee that a machine learning algorithm will find everything interesting in the data set. That's not possible. But we want, what we want to do is prioritize the objects that we think are the most interesting so we don't waste time. We don't waste the scientists' time having to look through thousands of objects Instead, you only have to look through a few hundred to find something potentially exciting. I want to finish off just showing some examples on, um, so this is some examples on some meerkat data. I couldn't resist because it's so beautiful. So here, this is radio data. So I took a quite a deep um, meerkat image and I just chopped it up into little squares. So you're, you're looking at those little squares in the image. And most of it is just noise or point sources. But if I run uh, the anomaly detection, then I get out these really interesting radio galaxies uh, that Meerkat's so good at picking up on. And here's a few examples of my favorites. I particularly like this one. Spiral galaxies are actually quite rare in the radio. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are just some cool examples. Okay, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to mention a couple more um, applications for Astronomy. This I already mentioned earlier, this deeper, wider, faster program where Sarah Webb came to me and had all these uh, light curves that she didn't know what to do with basically. And she did some very nice work applying both clustering and anomaly detection to her data. And in the end found some some variable stars that had been known about, some new variable stars, that, new discoveries, and some quite interesting uh, flare stars um, that uh, hadn't been detected before. So it just kind of shows that you can, you can take an unlabeled huge data set and using unsupervised machine learning, you can actually do something really interesting with it. Finally, I want to talk about real-time anomaly detection just to connect back with what I opened up with. So remember I said the Rubin Observatory will detect 10 million alerts every night. And that's really exciting because it's quite possible we'll discover something never been seen before. 
But the problem with transient astronomy is that you have to act quickly because this thing is literally going to fade away if you don't. Well, it'll fade away regardless, but you won't know what it is unless you do something about it. You follow up with other telescopes and study the object. So we need to know as early as possible if something is an anomaly or not. And now astronomy is really designed for an existing data set. You run it through it and you get, you get your list of most anomalous objects. So this is work I've done with a student in Cambridge. And he, um, we basically looked at known classes of transients. So these are some examples of known uh, astronomical objects that vary. And we built what's called a generative model, which means it's able to predict the value of the next point given all the previous points. So we built a generative model for each of these classes so that if something happens that, is, that deviates from the predictions of all known classes of objects, it could be an anomaly. And here's an example of it in action. So if you just look at this top panel first, this is a light curve, so you can see data coming in. The two different colors are two different filters. Okay. And then this plot over here shows the likelihood of belonging to any of the known classes. And it starts off that they're all pretty likely, but really quickly that likelihood drops to zero. And you can see correspondingly the anomaly score um, spikes really high. So in other words, this object doesn't look like anything that we have in our data set. And that's good because this was a, a something called a peculiar wade, so it was a strangely behaving supernova, and uh, this is with a, a real data set from the ZTF telescope. So, so this seems to be a, a really promising approach to do real time anomaly detection. Okay, so that's that wraps up my talk. Let me just conclude. Um, I think machine learning it, it has become just this absolutely critical central tool in handling the data deluge in astronomy, and I think in many other fields as well. And my argument is that if we don't have methods of automatic anomaly detection, we could miss out on some amazing scientific discoveries simply because the data has become so large. And our, our attempted answer to this that can work for image data, uh, time series data, spectra, you know, you name it, hopefully the idea is that it can work with it, is astronomy. If you're interested, there's the link to the paper and uh, the link to the code as well. Um, and just before I sign off, I wanted to mention a, an organization that I run called the Supernova Foundation. And it's a virtual mentoring program for women and gender minorities. So if you're interested in becoming a mentor or you're a student and you're interested in becoming a mentee, um, please just go check out the website. And I will finish off with my email address. So if you have any questions after this talk or um, want to just start a conversation, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Michelle Lorchner. It was a great, great uh, uh, talk. Very profound and very interesting. Uh, I would like to ask the audience if it, there is any question, please. It's time to shut up. Questions? Yeah, if the audience have a question, you can raise your hand if you want to talk and then we, we allow you to talk, okay? Se a plateia tiver alguma pergunta, pode ser em português, tá, pessoal? É, e vocês quiserem falar, vocês levantem as mãos e a gente permite que vocês falem. Questions? Don't be shy. Vamos lá, gente. Podem perguntar à vontade. So, people are congratulating you, Michelle, for the amazing talk, but I think they are too shy to ask questions. Uh, oh, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes? Someone was talking? 
Me e Marcelo, uh, the voiceless guy. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm try, uh, my voice is not okay today, but I'm, I'm trying to do something. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Mission, for the talk. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how, how can you ensure that uh, the, the 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 increased number of anomaly detections using this active uh, this active learning uh, is is it's not happened by uh, something like human bias, uh, some or something Perfect. like this, for yeah, example. That's a, that's a great question. Thanks, Marcelo. Yeah, um, in in a sense, you you are trying to bias the algorithm, right? Because you're trying to bias it away from the anomalies that you know you're not interested in. Um, so so it's, a, it's kind of a, a weird approach that the machine learning is less biased. So I'm not going to say it's not biased, but it's less biased. And then you actually introduce a bias with the active learning. But uh, what you're really doing, if you look at the, the equation, what it really does is, is downweights the things that you know that you're not interested in. So if any artifacts or whatever come up that are similar to things that you said, I'm not interested in those, they'll get downweighted. Because it has this concept of uncertainty, if anything new appears, that's really nothing like you've ever seen before, it's going to show up. So it's not going to get downweighted um, and you can also tune how sensitive the algorithm is to uh, the, you know, the human input. So how sensitive it is to the active learning. So basically how much you, you want to um, trust the human labeling and downweight the things that you're not interested in or versus how much you'd rather trust the algorithm, which means a higher rate of false positives. So probably more stuff that you don't care about but less likely to miss anything. Um, so in short, it is biased, um, but I think it's biased in a way that we, we understand and can predict so that such that we wouldn't miss anything that might be interesting. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks. There is a, a question from the audience that is the following question. Let me read it here. Uh, okay, there is if if there is any force not only to detect, detect anomalies, but to actually predict them? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's two, two interesting things I can point out about that. So um, for, for certain types of objects, which are, okay, there's a few things. There's, there's certain anomalies that we know are out there so that we can predict them. So for instance, kilonovi which are the, the optical uh, components of a gravitational wave. We know that they exist, we've observed one. Um, so, and using that one, we've made predictions of uh, the kind of rates that we might be able to get or the likelihood of, of detecting uh, kilonovi. So we, we actually can predict um, uh, how many of these objects we might expect. Then there are some objects that uh, people hypothesize might exist and so can simulate them and then also try to make predictions. But I mean, it's very difficult to make a prediction of something you're not even sure exists or not. Um, so this is something that does happen and those are sometimes included in simulations. Um, but then the third thing I'd like to point out, which is quite interesting with the, with the machine learning aspect is you can actually look for parts of data space that are currently uh, un not, not covered by existing data. And so you could say, oh, there's, there's a gap there. So we've never seen anything in that region of parameter space, but something might exist. Um, so predictions like this have been made for the Rubin Observatory, particularly for, for faster transients um, that we're, we're predicted to be able to observe. So, so there are definitely efforts in uh, sort of uh, looking for interesting regions of parameter space, but it's of course really difficult to predict predict the unexpected in general. Yeah. Okay, there are more questions. One question by Kaike Tennis. He congratulates you, Michelle, for the nice presentation. Then he asks, uh, 
which kind of architecture were used on the machine learning process? Was it a convolutional neural network, for instance? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I didn't actually end up using deep learning. It's something that one of the things that I did try, but um, it's actually quite difficult to use a CNN for anomaly detection because they really are constructed with supervised learning in mind where you need a, a training set. Um, so as far as I know, there doesn't exist a, a true deep learning anomaly detection algorithm. For those who are not familiar with deep learning, it's a, where you have very uh, deep neural networks with a very particular structure. And they're incredibly, incredibly powerful algorithms. They've completely revolutionized things like image recognition, um, but they're very computationally expensive and they require a lot of training. So in this case, I didn't actually use deep learning um, for the, for, well, for different data sets, I use different features. But for the uh, optical data, so for those galaxies, I uh, invented a new feature extraction method based on um, fitting ellipses, basically, uh, to the galaxies. And then it's quite simple and it's very fast and it works very well, where you'll find that when there's strange morphologies, things like the ellipses don't align with each other uh, and they end up uh, being a bit strange, so they pop up as anomalous. So I, I, I found that worked uh, faster and better than something like an autoencoder, which is something I also tried. Um, but I'm very interested in trying to get a deep learning approach to work for a problem like this. I think, sorry, I should mention one thing. The only uh, deep learning method that I know of that could work for a problem like this is something called the self-organizing map, um, which is a very interesting approach. Yeah. Great. Okay. And uh, one more question by some anonymous attendee. <laughs> In your opinion, what should be the first step for those who would like to work with machine learning applied to physics? Oh, that's a great question. So um, the cool thing is, I guess it's an upside and a downside about machine learning is this, there's so much out there. Like there's, there's, it's such a hot topic. There's so much material on uh, learning machine learning. You'll find a thousand videos explaining it, um, which is great because it means there's a, there's a lot uh, a lot out there that you can use, but it can get quite confusing uh, and quite over, overwhelming in the beginning. So um, I, th I always recommend there's a course on Coursera. Um, I, I forget the titles, just Introduction to Machine Learning or something like that, but it's by a lecturer called Andrew Ng. I'll put his name in the chat. Um, and he's, he does a really great job introducing really from basics uh, machine learning. Um, and he also has a corresponding deep learning course. So that's a, a great place to start. Um, there's also a, to, to get a lot more uh, hands-on practice, there's a website called Kaggle, kaggle.com. So it's actually a, a data science competition website. Um, if, if you want to try your luck at it, it's, it's got some quite hefty prize money associated with it, but it's very difficult to, to win a competition. Um, but they're, they're all basically machine learning competitions. And there's a lot of resources on there. There's a lot of tutorials and uh, free data sets. Um, there's even one or two astronomy data sets on there, there's astronomy based competitions. So that's a, that's a good place to start getting kind of hands on. And then once you've got the kind of the basic tools for machine learning, then you can start looking at papers where people have already applied machine learning to various problems in physics to kind of see, because you know, in science, we have some quite specific requirements in terms of things like dealing with uncertainties, dealing with low signal to noise. Um, you know, we, we really we really need our algorithms to be reliable and reproducible. Um, so it's, it's just good to read some papers on, on what people have done in your field. OK, OK, very nice replies. So I I'm you okay. I'm yes, okay. I'm sorry. I guess that we have uh, one participant that would like to talk here. Uh, I'm going to open his microphone. It's Pedro. Okay. okay. Pedro? Hello, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we are hearing loud. Uh, so I would like to, to ask to my, Michelle uh, first, 
I would like to say congratulations for your great work. It's a very interesting subject. And for me, it's just a curiosity, okay? It's a simple question because I'd like to know if, if was there any difficult to develop this work because uh, the subject is very interest, interesting, but it's new to me. But I'd like to know if, if there is some difficult to, to develop this subject. Yeah, um, I, that's a good question. I, I personally find, uh, I think machine learning is pretty easy to learn for a physicist. I think um, a lot of the concepts in data science that are so important, we already do as scientists. So I, th I think machine learning is a, is a really pretty straightforward subject to just dive into and, and um, get going with. I think that there are a few, um, how can I say it, pitfalls. There's, there, there's a few things you need to be careful about, um, some mistakes uh, that people make sometimes with machine learning. Um, but the more, you know, as long as you always apply quite rigorous scientific thinking and as you gain experience, you're not likely to, to make these kind of mistakes. So I think it's, um, it's a straightforward field to, to get into. Um, and I think that the difficulties usually lie in, in um, dealing with the data, uh, understanding your data, understanding your problem. The, the feature extraction step is often the most difficult step and requires uh, domain specific knowledge. So that's, that's usually the part that's, that's more challenging. Um, but it, it's, it's a great field and there's a lot of, uh, if you use Python, the programming language Python, there's some amazing existing tools uh, that are very easy to use. Um, so I think, I think for a scientist, it's, it's pretty straightforward to get into. And, and I think the only thing I would caution is that you make sure you, um, take the time to understand deeply if it's something that you want to get into, because on, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of data scientists in the world suddenly, and there's a lot of people who just use all these tools as black boxes without really understanding how they work and without really understanding some of the pitfalls and the dangers. Um, so it's, it's something to, to be careful about, but I think it's, it's a, it's a great, pretty great field to be in. Okay. Okay. So, so we'll should then thank Michelle for your nice talk and be kind to okay. answer the people. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>
at the chat and share message with the other participants. But please, uh, for questions, you use the this button Q and A because it's more much more harder for us to uh, to see what is happening in the chat uh, when it comes to questions. Okay, so so please use this button. Uh, it's going to make our life easier here. Uh, I believe you can you can introduce the the next uh, ah. lecture, uh, Amilka. Thank you. Ah. Okay, okay. So our next uh, speaker is Professor P.K. Sahu. He got his PhD in mathematics from Sambalpur University in India, and uh, he's an associate professor at Bitspilani Hyderabad campus. Uh, his main subject is general relativity and cosmology, and he's going to talk to us today about wormholes in f of r t gravity and general relativity. Please, Professor Sahu, you can yeah. start. Yeah. So good morning, all. Uh, so am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. So my screen is uh, visible. Yes. Also. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So first of all, I will give my thanks to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my research. And in particularly, Professor Santos for inviting me. So uh, I'll speak about the wormholes. Uh, in the beginning part, I will go for the basics of the wormholes. Then I will take one model of wormhole in uh, modified FRT gravity. And I will compare this model with the uh, general relativity. So these are my outline of the talk. Okay. So the first question is, uh, is it possible uh, the time travel through wormhole? So going through uh, the time travel through wormhole, so I will just take you some uh, movies where these wormholes are used. So if you go for the movie Contact in 1997, you can see Jodie Foster travel to another planet by the help of wormhole. Then uh, in 2011, uh, if you go for the movie Thor, then there also a wormhole is used to travel between Earth and the Asgard. And in the movie Interstellar, uh, the most recent in 2014, uh, so the wormhole was used uh, to travel farthest regions of the universe in search of the habitat planet. And these are basically the depictions of the wormholes and the interstellar travel, uh, which is basically the science fascinate. So it is fascinate scientist and a space enthusiastic ally. But exactly we'll uh, going through this talk, what are the wormholes and how they will work. Now, basically, a uh, wormhole is a hypothetical shortcut between two distant regions of the space-time. As if you go through Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, he described about the cosmology through the uh, space-time. So, uh, let me visualize this uh, wormhole. So, just me, let me take the figure. So, if you go for 2D, you just take a, a piece of paper. Just take a piece of paper and hold it. Okay, so this is a piece of paper which is folded and suppose one is wants to travel from point A to point B. So instead of traveling throughout the surface of the paper, so he can make a hole here to reach the point from A to B. So that is basically the idea of the wormhole. So uh, if you go for a uh, intrinsically flat two dimensional space as a folded piece of paper embedded in a higher three dimensional space, uh, like the next diagram, so where a tube connects two distant points A and B on the paper. So the length through the tube, uh, that is basically the wormhole, can be much less than the distance from A to B along the paper. So this is basically a shortcut distance between two points in the paper. So the same idea was used in the wormhole to connecting two distant regions through a shortcut. Then if you go for the three dimension, so a full three-dimensional wormhole would have entrance and it has an exit. So there are three-dimensional spheres rather than two-dimensional ring-like mouths of the paper tube. So if you go for this figure, so there are paper, so if you go for it, you can see the uh, uh, mouth-like thing in the two-dimension, but whereas if you go for this 3D, you can get these spheres. 
So this is basically the two mouth. So this is one mouth. The other end is another mouth. And these two mouths are connected by this throat. So this is the idea of the wormhole. So here, uh, there are three dimensional spheres rather than two dimensional wing like mouths. So such lower dimensional human friendly visualizations are termed as the MD diagram. So if anybody will go through the wormhole articles, they can see the embedded diagrams of the wormholes. And these are basically the wormhole image is usually as well known as the square child embedding, embedding diagram, which is the wormhole analogy for a static non-rotating non square child black hole. Now, Coming to the general relativity, so wormholes are basically uh, to be filled with exotic matter. So this is not same as the dark matter. So this is the different, uh, this which basically the exotic matter, which does not satisfy the energy conditions and there is a possibility of negative density. And this is uh, known as the einstein rosen bridge. It is a topological feature that will fundamentally be a shortcut connecting two separate points in the space time or two separate regions in the space time. And this contains two mouths, as I showed in the evening diagram. And there is a throat connecting the two mouths that is the separate points in the space time like a tunnel. And this was introduced by the American uh, theoretical physicist John Wheeler in 1957. And how the name wormhole came, uh, the idea is uh, uh, this. So you take an apple and this worm wants to travel from one end to other end through the apple. So instead of this worm traveling in the surface of the apple, so what he can do, he can make a hole from one end and exit in other end. So that is the idea of uh, the name wormhole coming from this picture. So that is what the idea what John Wheeler took in 1957. Now, uh, these two figures are very much clear. If you take a piece of uh, fabric and put some weight, and then due to gravitational attraction, you can get the uh, sag. And this is basically the second figure uh, is a black hole, supermassive black hole, which makes a tear like the wormhole. So this is a space-time tear, which we use to say the uh, black hole. And these two regions would meet and form a wormhole connection. Basically, if there is a tear in the space time and this tear is the wormhole and these two regions will form, meet and they form a wormhole connection, which is known as the throat of the wormhole. So these wormholes are not black holes because if you go for the black hole, we used to say that everything can enter but nothing can exit. So that's why we always used to tell that this is a one-way trip. Anybody can enter, but nothing can exit. But if you go for the wormhole, it is two-way. There is an entrance and there is an exit. So one can enter and exit from the wormhole. So then the next question is, do wormhole actually exist? So there is no observational evidence or the, uh, for the wormholes currently exist. It is basically a mathematical solution of the Einstein's field equation in general theory of relativity. Like the black holes, uh, which was observed in 19, uh, 2019, April 10, by Event Horizon Telescope, that there was black holes. At the same time, there is no observational evidence for the wormholes, only it is a mathematical solution to the Einstein's field equation in general theory of relativity. And these wormholes made completely a normal matter with positive energy density and inherently it is unstable. And there may be, uh, it would be likely to collapse in the presence of nearby matter or matter that tried to traverse through the wormhole. So basically we'll study the stable traversable wormholes, uh, which is exist and their entrance and exist we are held open by exotic matter with a negative energy density. But then coming to the history, uh, this was started by Albert Einstein in 1916. And then uh, uh, Flam in 1916 got the white hole solution. Uh, then Schwarzschild, uh, the, which we uh, famous for the Schwarzschild solutions, uh, 
uh, the static spherical symmetric square child solutions. So the first exact solution to the Einstein field equation in 1916. Then in 1921, uh, the German mathematician Weyl first proposed the wormhole theory. After that, uh, this is the cover of the book. Uh, a wormhole is a theoretical passage through space time, which is known as the Einstein Rosen Bridge in 1935. So, Einstein and Nathan Rosen gave the proof for the uh, wormhole. So, after that, uh, in 1948, Godel got the time tunnel is possible. Then, uh, uh, the famous one is the Wheeler, who gave the name in 1957 as wormhole. Uh, then, after 30 years, then after that, there is not much work after 1957. Then, the promising work after 30 years come uh, by Morris and Trone in 1988. And that is what they gave the most promising wormhole as tool to teach the general relativity and they propose the traversable wormholes. Now coming to the type of wormholes. So by the name of the physicist, uh, there are wormholes called as the uh, Schwarzschild wormhole, Lorenz wormhole, Maurice Throne wormhole, Ellis wormhole, then Matt Visser wormhole because he proposed the Australian scientist Matt Visser also pro proposed some wormholes named after their ideas. But there are multiple ideas about the different type of wormholes based upon their functions. So primarily, there are six uh, type of wormholes exist. So these six types are the traversable wormhole, which is the most promising. And the more research is going on this. And this is basically these traversable wormholes are used in the science fiction and the Hollywood movies. Then the next one is the non-traversable wormholes. So these are basically nothing can pass through it. Either the wormhole will collapse very fast. So it only has an entry point, but there is no exit. Then coming to the next one, uh, the one-way. Uh, the one-way wormholes are one-way trip, meaning you can only travel through them and you cannot uh, separate the wormhole from the return trip. Then coming to the black holes, Yes, black holes are actually types of one-way wormholes uh, that everybody knows that anything can enter a black hole, but due to its intense gravitational pull, nothing can escape. Then the next one is white holes, so which uh, is very easy. Now, coming to the other wormholes, there are two-way wormholes. Uh, basically, the wormholes are round trip, as I told from the beginning, one can enter and exit. Then intra-inverse, so the intra-inverse wormholes are located in our own inverse and are traveling from one point to another point within our inverse. Then inter-universe, the inter-universe wormholes connect from one inverse to another parallel inverse. And this is a basically space, uh, uh, a diagram of the spacecraft traveling through a traversable wormhole, which I took from NASA's picture. Now coming to the idea, so we want to create a traversable and stable wormhole for use in space travel. And these are the intra-universe, that is two-way traversable wormholes. So this is basically just I show that how uh, Einstein is passing, going through Earth to our nearest galaxy, Andromeda galaxy, through the wormhole. Okay. Now come to the basics. So this is basically when you go for study of this wormhole, uh, they are uh, a, uh, generally uh, these are uh, obtained by solving Einstein field equation in a reverse direction. We used to solve this is a reverse direction. That means first consider an interesting and exotic space time matter. So this is the space time uh, which you have to, uh, beginning you have to consider it. Then go for the matter and find the, uh, respective geometry and it is interesting to note that it allow effective uh, superluminal travel. So that is not the basic idea of the wormhole. So this is the equation one is the spherically symmetric wormhole matrix uh, with uh, Schwarzschild coordinates is given in equation one. So there are two unknowns A of R and B of R. So A of R is known as the redshift function and B of R is known as the uh, shape function. So through B of R, so we'll uh, measure this travel 
through B of R, uh, the radial coordinate, the shape function, and R is the radial coordinate which uh, is from R naught to infinity. And this R naught is known as the throat radius. So there are four minimum conditions which a wormhole metric must satisfy. So the first condition is known as the throat condition. That means at the point R naught. So B of R naught is equal to R naught. Then the second condition is known as the flaring out condition. So the flaring out condition says that uh, the derivative of uh, the set function with respect to the radial coordinate. Uh, so uh, dy, the derivative of B of R at R naught must be less than one. So this is known as the flaring out condition. Then the third condition is known as the flatness condition. So the flatness condition says that, uh, so B of R by R tends to zero when R tends to infinity. And the last condition is known as for the redshift. So it is on the uh, redshift function that the redshift function must be finite everywhere for the traversable wormholes. So these are the four minimum conditions where a wormhole metric has to satisfy. Now coming to the exotic matter. So from the beginning, I told that it is uh, not same as the dark matter or antimatter. It is basically, it contains negative energy density and a large amount of negative pressure and mass. And such type of matter has seen in the behavior of vacuum states as part of quantum field theory. So in case of this Schwarzschild wormholes, uh, it was found that it would collapse too quickly for anything to cross from one end to the other end. And in traversable wormholes, uh, would be only be possible if this exotic matter with negative energy density will be used to stabilize it. And for the development of wormhole structures, an exotic fluid is required, which violates the non-energy condition. So this is the important point uh, in this wormhole theory, because they have to violate this uh, null energy condition out of the four energy conditions. So next I will go for the energy conditions. So there are four energy conditions. Uh, they are the null energy condition. Okay, so the energy conditions are basically the right of the equations that describe the behavior of the uh, geometry. That is whether this is time-like, space-like or light-like curves. So it is commonly used in the general theory of relativity to study the singularities. And mostly if you go for the singularity problems in the Penrose or Stephen or Stephen Hawkins, so you can see the singularities there. And they use uh, this uh, energy conditions are used very much there. Now the first energy condition is the null energy condition, which says that the sum of the density and pressure are uh, greater than or equal to zero. So, which is presented in equation five. This is the minimum requirement which is obtained from the uh, strong energy condition and weak energy condition, the SCC and WC. So, second one is the weak energy condition. So, with the weak energy condition is the addition of uh, null energy with uh, the density always positive. Then the third one is the strong energy condition. And if you go for the 1998 uh, paper by Matt Visser, which says that due to the acceleration of the universe, the strong energy condition has to be violated. And the last one is the dominant, uh, dominant energy condition, which tells that the density is always greater than equal to the magnitude, magnitude of the pressure. So these are the four uh, popular energy conditions, which is used in the singularity problems. Now coming to the phantom era and the wormhole geometry. So basically, if you go for if you go for the accelerated expansion of the universe through the equation of state parameter, then we used to tell that when the equation of state parameter uh, p by rho is equal to minus one, then it is the standard cosmological model or the lambda CDM. Then from the zero to minus one, we used to say that it is a quintense region, and less than minus one is known as the phantom region. So basically, uh, the singularity problems always uh, in the phantom era. Okay, now coming to the wormhole solution. As I told, it is a reverse engineering process where we have to consider the wormhole metric and the matter. So the matter content here is represented in equation nine. 
which is the energy momentum tensor for the anisotropic fluid. So here rho stands for the density, uh, PT is the traversial pressure and rho is the radial pressure. And here this UI, UJ are the four velocity vector, whereas XI, XJ are the uh, four velocity vector. Uh, so radial unit vector, four vector. Then uh, the matter Lagrangian. So the matter Lagrangian, as you uh, know, you can take it is the density or the pressure. So the matter Lagrangian is here minus P and which is the pressure and P stands for the radial pressure plus two transverse pressure. Then let us go for the FRT gravity. So this FRT gravity basically proposed by Harko and his team in 2011. And in that 2011 article, they have proposed three forms of FRT gravity. So out of the three forms, the first two forms are the linear form and the third one is the nonlinear form. So out of these three forms, we have taken in this article, this first form. So where F of RT is called R plus 2FT and F of T is the function of the stress energy tensor T, which is called to lambda T. And here lambda is the model parameter. And if you make this lambda is equal to zero, then this FRT gravity will reduce to general theory of relativity. And the FRT gravity field equation is given in equation 10. Now, uh, taking the metric, uh, the wormhole metric with the energy momentum tensor, we can get the Einstein field equation for the FRT gravity, which is given in equations 11 to 13. Now we can see from 11 to 13, there are three equations with uh, four unknowns. So uh, two pressure, then density and the safe function. So there are four equations, uh, four unknowns with three equations. Hence to get a deterministic solution, we have assumed some extra conditions. So first of all, we proposed a new exponential function first time in the literature uh, uh, by me and my collaborators, uh, Pedro Morias and my two students, which is published in uh, last year, December in Chinese physics letter. So this equation 14 is the new safe function which was proposed by us. And if you see the figure one, this safe function, which is called the exp exp exponential safe function satisfies the minimum requirement of the wormhole condition. So the four conditions was given in this figure one, and one can observe that all the four conditions are satisfied by the proposed exponential safe function. And here we have taken the wormhole throat R0 is 0.5. Now, taking this uh, safe function, so our pressure and density with equation of state parameter uh, omega, which uh, with the radial coordinate is PR by rho are given in these equations. Now, going through the figures, you can see that the equation of state parameter omega is below minus one. So which indicates that uh, this is in the phantom era. Now, coming to the next figure in figure three, you can see that all the energy conditions are validated except the strong energy condition. So the, valid, uh, the violation of strong energy condition tells that the model is accelerating model, whereas it is satisfies all other energy conditions. So the point here is due to the modified gravity, because uh, the property of wormhole geometry is it has to violate the null energy condition. But in this case, you can see that the null energy condition is satisfied. That means there is no exotic matter in this model due to the modified gravity. Then we can see what is the behavior in general theory of relativity. Now, at the same time, we make uh, lambda is equal to zero. So when you make lambda is equal to zero, this FRT gravity reduces to general theory of relativity. Now, if you see the behavior of the energy conditions in general theory of relativity, which is given in figure four, that O except one, uh, the null energy condition in radial coordinate, all other energy conditions are violated. So this proves that there is exotic matter in general theory of relativity in the proposed wormhole metric with the safe function. So it validates that this is uh, theoretically valid as it violates all the energy conditions except one. 
So hence, our proposed model is validated through general theory of relativity, presenting that there is exotic matter. But if you see in the modified theory of gravity, that is the FRT gravity, so here all the energy conditions are validated except the strong energy condition. And as per the article of Matt Visser in 1998, the violation of strong energy condition indicates the acceleration of the model, which is as per the current expansion. Now, coming to the conclusion, basically, as I explained, the wormholes are tube-like structures, uh, which are shortcuts, and it connects to distant regions in the universe. If their geometrical structure was not singular enough, then according to the general theory of relativity, wormholes are expected to be filled by exotic matter. Then due to the lack of observation, uh, the wormholes are makes one unable to predict exactly some of their geometrical and material properties, such as the shape function and the equation of step. So in the present article, we have proposed a, a new shape function called as the exponential shape function. And on the other hand, we did not need to assume any particular form for the wormhole equation of state, which was obtained from the model rather than imposing it. And before going any further on this discussion, the equation, para, equation of state parameter obtained, we should mention that for exponential shape function, which is given in equation 14 and in figure one, it is satisfies all the required four conditions for the traversable asymptotically flat wormholes. And in this uh, case, our equation of state parameter omega also constructed and it was there in the Andromeda. That is what in the figure two, our equation of state parameter is less than minus one, as, uh, implying that it is in the phantom era and there may be possibility of B grip singularity. Now coming to the third figure, which is in FRT gravity about the energy conditions. It shows that uh, the null energy condition, weak energy condition, all the conditions except the strong energy conditions satisfied. Then the violation of strong energy condition, already I told it is uh, as per the accelerated expansion of the universe. Now, these are the few references which are used in this article. And thank you all for your patience to listening to me. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, Professor Sahu, uh, for the nice <coughs> talk. I'd like to ask if uh, anyone has a question to Professor Sahu. Questions? Yeah, Amir, uh, can I have a, a question? Okay, go on. Okay, so before the question, thank you, Sahu. It's a, really a pleasure to see you and uh, see you well. And uh, I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, Sahu and I, we started... Uh, I guess in the last year to, to collaborate with each other and it's really a pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, then uh, uh, my question is, uh, I, I saw your graphics about the energy conditions uh, for the FRT model uh, uh, when you submitted to a wormhole solution. And I guess it's really interesting that uh, it seems to, to make more favorable to to have the, the uh, wormhole solution then in, in the general, general relativity, at least in respect to the energy condition. So, uh, it, and I, I remember that uh, the, the point when Harko put this, the, the, this component of the energy momentum uh, tensor in the, the theory for gravity was that it is related with uh, vacuum energy. So, yeah. uh, so uh, it seems that, well, uh, it seems that the vacuum energy in such a way it uh, prefers uh, uh, wormhole solutions than uh, 
the standard general relativity model with the cosmological constant. So do you have uh, any kind of comment about this? Uh, so basically, uh, this, uh, as I told here, we proposed a vacuum solution. Basically, as you mentioned also, yeah. so this is the uh, source fluid, uh, which is basically go for the uh, vacuum type of solution, which we proposed from the beginning. And uh, as you mentioned that about the lambda CDM. Okay. So uh, when you go for the singularity problems, basically uh, the singularity problems always uh, goes in the phantom era. So when you go for the phantom era, then the equation of state parameter must be less than minus one. And our lambda CDM model approaches to minus one. So the singularity problems, uh, uh, as per the literature, they are always uh, uh, comes uh, in the phantom era. So I don't think uh, it will approach to the lambda CDM model. Okay, okay. So thank you. It's really interesting, uh, the results that you presented. And uh, uh, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. It was a pleasure. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, is there any further question? Questions? So, so I mentioned that uh, uh, I collaborated with Professor Santos uh, mostly one year and we published two articles, uh, one in Physical Review D and another in, in European Physical Journal Plus. And uh, the third article is under review. Uh, so, great. Uh, yeah, it is a nice collaboration and uh, a fruitful result also because publishing in Physical Review D uh, one of our articles in this year. So we, we, this year we published already two articles and the third one is in under review. So oh. thanks Professor Santos for our collaboration and inviting me to this uh, platform because uh, my background is mathematics and I'm giving a talk in the uh, seminar physics. So really it is a pleasure for me. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks to you for for the time and to share the knowledge with us. Thanks a lot. So, João, what should we do now? Okay, uh, so again, thank you, Sahu. And now we are going to have a break time. Uh, we have 30 minutes of break, and then we, we go back live at uh, 11 here in Brazil, 11 o'clock here in Brazil, uh, with the, our next presentation, which is from Professor uh, Philip Bou. So thank you again, uh, people. And uh, well, you can stay at the room if you want. You don't need to leave. Uh, the web link to access this room, it, it is going to be the same web link along the entire, uh, along the entire event. So you can you can stay in the uh, in the room if you want. Uh, but I'm going to just to stop the recording and also the live transmission. Okay. So we go back in live at eleven. Thank you. <laughs>